Enemy design in single player games matters a lot. Oftentimes, the behavior of enemies dictate how the game should be played. For example, in Uncharted, if you're running around shooting enemies instead of peeking in and out of cover, you die. In Doom, if you peek in and out of cover instead of running around shooting enemies, you die. And in Dark Souls, you die. My point is, a game is more or less designed to be played a certain way, and the enemies are often the ones who enforce it. In Uncharted, enemies ramp up their accuracy the longer the player is exposed to force them into taking cover. But to make sure the player doesn't camp in one spot for the entire encounter, Enemies throw grenades to make them move. And in Doom, it's the opposite. Enemies become less accurate when the player moves, while also remaining spaced out to encourage the player to move. When I started designing the enemies for my game, I did not design them to enforce how I wanted the game to be played. Instead, I designed them to be good at killing the player, which kind of sucks ass to play. And just for reference, my game is supposed to be a movement shooter like Doom, where you are encouraged to move around and punch things. I feel like in every video, I always mention Doom, so for the rest of this video, I'm going to refrain from mentioning it. I've also talked a lot about the enemies in past videos, since they always change from devlog to devlog. And while this one is no exception, I am pretty happy with the way the enemies now work, and I feel like the enemies are basically finalized. I hope. So to start off, let's talk about enemy positioning. I wanted a solution that could keep enemies spaced out and have them hold their position while remaining visible so that the player can easily shoot them. To handle this, I use something that I call anchor points, which are circles that are manually placed throughout the level that tell the enemies where to stand when attacking the player. Enemies get assigned to a collection of anchor points called, get this, an anchor group, which limits the selection of anchor points an enemy can move to. So by using anchor groups, I can control the spacing between enemies as well as what area of the level they occupy. This allows the player to push through the level more instead of having all the enemies run at the player. Typically though, each enemy has several anchor points to choose from, so they needed a way to decide which one to be in. So each anchor point has a set of nodes that raycast to the player in order to calculate a player visibility score. Then an enemy chooses which one to move to based on the visibility score and how close it is to that anchor point. Once in the anchor point, the nodes determine where the enemy should stand by averaging the positions of the nodes that have player visibility. This solution worked pretty well, but the enemies would change positions frequently, and a lot of the time seemed unnecessary to do so. So to help mitigate this, I decided that in order for an enemy to change anchor points, they need to lose line of sight to the player for 3 seconds, while also limiting any movement change within the current anchor point to every 2 seconds. Not a perfect solution, but hey, that's software development. Another system important to movement shooters is enemy accuracy. If you want the player to move around and do 360 gainers off the walls, your AI need to let the player do that. In essence, I wanted them to be inaccurate enough to let the player run around, but yet accurate enough to make the game challenging, all without feeling completely random. And this was a bit of a hard problem for me to solve, but fortunately there is one game that I know of which pulls it off well. Well I guess we're talking about Doom again. I get a lot of comments saying that my game is copying Carlson. But in reality, I'm actually just copying Doom. Anyways, I pretty much stole the way Doom handles enemy accuracy and tweaked it to better fit my game. So basically, we can use weighted probabilities defined as a curve that represents the distribution of projectiles. What the fuck did I just say? So if we have a curve and divide it up into even slices, a slice's x value represents the distance from the center of the player a projectile will pass by at, and the section's y value represents the normalized probability of that occurring. So if I want enemies to hit the player more, I can add more area under the curve closer to zero. And if I want them to hit the player less, then I can add more area further away from zero. I also use three separate curves for when the player is standing, moving, and wall running. When the player is standing, the enemies have a much greater likelihood to hit the player than when moving. And then when the player wall runs, the enemies turn into stormtroopers. 
This is because I both wanted to give wall running more of a purpose during combat, while also allowing the player to move between sections of the level safely. Another thing I wanted for the game is the ability to have a lot of enemies in a given area. I found that having more enemies makes the game more engaging, while also helping the game feel a bit more alive. But when having a high density of enemies, it became overwhelming for the player to fight them all at once. This is why in my last video I created a system that chooses a subset of enemies to be attackers based off of a scoring system that factors in distance and line of sight to the player, as well as enemy type. This is called the enemy's attack score. You should write that down, I bring it up later in this video. So when an enemy becomes an attacker, they navigate to an anchor point and start attacking, while the other enemies move into cover and wait for their turn to become an attacker. And for the enemies to take cover semi-intelligently, I needed to create a cover system that would determine what positions are valid cover. And for the cover system to determine what positions are valid cover, there need to be positions. The way this works is I manually place cover points on object prefabs that then get placed in the levels. The cover system grabs all the points and calculates if a point is valid by checking for line of sight to the player and the dot product to make sure the cover sits in between the enemy and player. The nice thing about this approach is that I only need to place cover points once for each object since all instances of the object will reference the prefab with cover points. The downside being I have to manually place cover points. There's also this issue where placing prefabs next to other objects, walls, or in the air make certain cover points inaccessible to the enemies. The enemies don't know that and will try to go to them because they are stupid. So to prevent this from happening, I have an editor script check if a given cover point is over the nav mesh. And if it's not, then it gets removed from the list of possible cover points. So as long as I remember to rebake the nav mesh, the problem is solved. Another addition I made is enemies now stagger their attacks. This is a change that no one would notice, but makes the game worse if it weren't there. Since without it, multiple enemies could attack simultaneously, which not only sounds and looks weird, but could potentially kill the player quickly, making the game feel unfair. Also, this caused enemies to be on cooldown at the same time, which left these awkward gaps in combat where no one was shooting. But by having a small delay between every attack, the enemies have more of a rhythm which helps to keep up the intensity of combat while mitigating the other issues. And the system responsible for deciding which enemies are allowed to attack and when is called the Attack Coordinator. So whenever an enemy wants to attack, it must first make a request to the attack coordinator and wait for its response before attacking. The attack coordinator decides which enemy request to fulfill by choosing the enemy with the highest attack score. This ensures that the order in which enemies attack make more sense. For example, if there are two enemies where one is right in front of the player and the other is more in the background, the closest to the player should attack first since otherwise it does nothing right in front of the player. And then there are also scenarios where enemy requests are always skipped because some of them are greedy assholes. To fix this, the attack coordinator adds the amount of time an enemy has been waiting to attack to its attack score. So eventually a skipped enemy will have the largest attack score and be allowed to attack. And well, that's about all I wanted to talk about in this video. Thank you to everyone who still watches my videos after almost a year of not uploading, and happy holidays.